Please welcome Paul Nixon. Ke te mihi ki tēnā whenua, ko Melbourne, Australia, tēnā koutou. Ke te mihi ki nā manuhiri maha, tēnā koutou. Nō reira, tēnā tātou koutou. Ko Kongwe te mona, ko Kongwe te awa, ko Kongwe te rohi, ko Gwena te iwi, ko Nati Kamri te iwi, ko Paul Nixon toko in Ngoa. He tonga te Family Group Conference at Aotearoa, ko te whānau, te kai korero o te pepe me te tamariki. He aha, te mea nui o te au. He tangata, he tangata, he tangata nō rera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutou. Uh, greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you about social work in New Zealand. I just welcomed people of the land here in Melbourne. Um, and those of you who are visiting the area come from outside to join. Um, I also told you a bit about where I'm from. Um, the mountain I'm connected to, the river and the valley in Conway, North Wales, uh, where I'm from. And then I went on to say that in New Zealand, uh, the concept of bringing families together, family group conferences is important to children, young people, community. And that the most important thing um, to us in everything we do, of course, is people, as it is to you. That's why you're here today. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Adam, for inviting me. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I am from the UK, from Wales, Cymru, uh, North Wales. And um, I've been in uh, New Zealand now as Chief Social Worker for about uh, two and a half years. And um, we settled in Wellington, the family. Um, it's a, just a great privilege to be here today, and I've come here for the three days to... I listen and learn and find out about what's happening uh, around Australasia with child protection work. Um, William Gibson was writing in The Economist some time ago and he said the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet, which I think is a nice idea. And uh, conferences like this are a fantastic opportunity to learn from each other, gather information, go home and try and apply some of those ideas uh, where you work. So I want to say a little bit about um, children uh, first and my experience as a social worker. I've been a social worker for uh, 23 years now. I've always worked in care and protection, uh, mostly in the UK and now in uh, New Zealand. And you learn, don't you, as you do social work, you're learning, you're constantly learning all the time the best ways of, uh, of practice. I remember one of my very earliest experiences as a social worker, um, a student social worker in my final placement in the child protection team. Um, my supervisor said, look, this is a particularly hostile family who really don't like social workers. Um, and he seemed very pleased about that. He knew it was going to be a bit of a challenge for me. So um, I got on the bus to make my home visit. Um, and I prepared myself with my active listening skills and non-judgmental positive regard, which I'd learnt all about at university. And I knew there was a dad at home and mum had gone. And dad was at home with a five-year-old boy. And the older boy, I think, was in care at the time. So I got up to the front door, um, steeled myself a bit, knocked on the front door, expecting the father to answer. Um, and the five-year-old answered the door. He opened the door, looked up at me, and he said, Are you the wanker? <laughs> to which my only possible response was, Yes. <laughs> I'm your new social wanker. Um, anyhow, very, quick, I mean, very quickly I realized that Dad had given him a very strong message about who was going to be visiting that day and um, that our father was going to be effective helping this young person and I'd have to work with the father as well as, as him, really important. So um, that was my first lesson in, um, in social work. And um, then as I grew up a bit more, I started a family, had a family, got married, um, three children. Uh, there's Karis now, he's 15, and Karis is a, a Welsh name and it means beloved. Um, and then um, my youngest is Rihanna, uh, which is also a Welsh name, and Rihanna means moon princess. So she rather likes that. She has a moonstone that she wears on her chest. And my middle child is Hayden. He's a boy, he's 13. And Hayden means he who dwells in a hedge, which is just a perfect name for him. <laughs> Anyhow, um, kids are fantastic, aren't they? Kids are fantastic at 
you know, teasing out the truth so quickly. I'm going to talk a bit about children, but Karis, um, when she was little, this is a picture of her when she was little in, um, in uh, south of England. It's raining, of course. Uh, middle of summer, as you can see. Um, and Karis uh, says to uh, Nikki, my wife, um, Mummy, what does Daddy do at work? Nikki thought about this a bit and said, Well, he tries to help mummies and daddies who are having problems looking after children. So Karis said, Do you mean like you, Mum? Because he's probably, <laughs> kids are just great at speaking the truth. Okay, so here they are, the three of them, in North Yorkshire. As you can see, the weather's a bit different there. When we left North Yorkshire in February 2011, it was minus 22 in the evening. It was cold. And Murphy, our dog, who, um, who came over on the plane as well sometime after us, he's now in New Zealand. We've got a cat too now. New Zealand cat. And here's a picture of my house in North Yorkshire before I came over. <laughs> the sharp-eyed ones amongst you will know it's the house at the front of the picture there, not the one at the back. So one of the things I do as, as chief social worker is to travel around the country and to meet with social workers and listen to social workers, because that seems to be an important thing to do in terms of understanding what's working in terms of practice and how they're making a difference in the lives of children. Um, and of course, all that contact with the front line colours in, colours in all the data you see that the organisation reports on. So you see all these statistics and patterns and trends, and then you go and talk to the social workers, and they'll tell you quite a different story. So I've spent time traveling the country, listening to social workers, learning from them, and, and taking advice about how we can improve practice. As, I, as I've gone, taking some pictures from around New Zealand. So I'm going to show you some pictures. How many of you have been to New Zealand before in the room? Oh, wow, lots of you. Okay, this is my third time in Melbourne. It's a fantastic city, fantastic city. Any Kiwis here today? Okay, great, welcome. Hey, nice to see you. Okay, um, and of course the light is different uh, in New Zealand to Wales. Uh, it still rains a lot, there's lots of similarities, but there's lots of differences too. So we have a, a, a strategy that's reflecting our core practice priorities in New Zealand. I want to talk to you this morning about practice and about policy and some of the things that are occurring inside New Zealand that may be of interest to you in terms of our work. Mamato matato means you, me, us, you, me, us, working together. Um, and so that shapes and frames a lot of the work that we do. So I thought I'd just start with some context, really, about New Zealand and what's happening uh, in the country. So there's 1.2 million children in New Zealand. Um, and what we're seeing is very high numbers of notifications coming in. Um, we did some international comparisons on the notifications. It looks like in New Zealand we take three times as many notifications in than... Uh, any other jurisdiction we compared with. We compared with the Australian states, looked at UA, UK, US, etc. It seems that there's a very responsive system in New Zealand taking lots and lots of notifications, and I'll talk a bit about that some more. Um, there are 22,000 substantiations of child abuse, and the standout area of child abuse is emotional abuse. It's interesting hearing the speaker this morning talk about the impact of domestic violence. So that rising number of 22,000 substantially represents huge notifications in relation to domestic violence, domestic violence notifications, and children finding they're growing up in situations where there's domestic violence occurring. Interestingly, when we compared the data in New Zealand to other jurisdictions in relation to some of the perhaps easier to measure areas of child abuse, uh, child physical abuse, child sexual abuse, uh, we're very average with the rest of the world. In fact, probably slightly below average. So if you look at some of the hardest measures of child abuse, child homicide, intracranial injury, long bone fracture, hospital admissions, New Zealand's very average with the rest of the world. Um, when you look at the area of emotional abuse and neglect, it seems that we're very sensitive in those areas and responding uh, very quickly. The other thing is a, there seems to be a key trade-off in the area of neglect and emotional abuse. In other words, there's some level of... Um, uh, professional dis discussion and decision about is that emotional abuse or is that neglect because the nature of those two forms of child abuse have a significant degree of overlap in terms of uh, the impact on children. Care numbers in New Zealand are stable, relatively low. Um, many, many children, most children in care are placed with their family Farno, so most are placed in kinship care, around 60%. And we're seeing increasingly the needs of children in care are, are very complex, very complex needs. So this won't surprise you. You start to look at the statistics. What we're seeing in the last three years is a sort of levelling off very much of activity, a sort of plateaus occurring. But the, the light blue line, beneath the dark line, are notifications from the police on domestic violence. 
Um, so it went from in 2004, 3,300 to 78,000. Uh, you can see the huge sensitivity and rise in relation to domestic violence notifications to Jai and family. And part of the problem with that is that the work's got nowhere else to go currently in New Zealand. There's not a well-developed infrastructure of alternative services that this work can go. So you see this rise, all of it's landing at the child, youth and family doorstep. That's probably not a good strategy in terms of a differentiated set of responses, but I'll come on to that issue later. And that's just the graph on child abuse substantiations. The top line there is emotional abuse, and you can see the significant rise linked with domestic violence and then the sort of levelling off, the plateauing of that type of abuse. So these are some of the contextual things that are happening in New Zealand in terms of patterns of child abuse. Strikingly, uh, and you'll be familiar with this, when you look at the large cohorts of children, either emotional abuse or neglect, which are the biggest areas, you're seeing a constellation of risk factors operating together. Um, uh, parental drug and alcohol abuse domestic violence and untreated parental mental health problems. And it's the interplay and the interaction of these risk factors that's creating complex and hostile environments for children. Now, we did, a, we did an analysis of 10 years' worth of Cyrus records, looked at 10 years' worth of Cyrus records using a data mining tool which, which ran through the system and drew out typologies of needs. So we talked about family breakup, drug alcohol, sexual abuse, family violence, physical abuse ran this through 10 years' worth of Cyrus records, which is actually, that's the that's this child and family record system, it's actually 17 million pages of case records, astonishing amount of data. And inside of that, we saw the most common problem running through uh, uh, child protection social as what? What was the single most common recurring problem in one in four occasions, do you think? Shout it out, what do you think it was? Say again? Very good. Alcohol and drugs. Alcohol and drugs was the single biggest recurring problem. And the second biggest one? What do you think the second biggest one was? Domestic. Exactly right. Bang on. Domestic violence. So same pattern here? Same problem here? Same pattern around the world. Okay. So you're seeing a very strong... Now what's striking about these problems of child abuse, of course, is that no single agency can resolve this on their own. There's no question about that. Uh, child protection intervention just focuses at the top end of trying to manage risk and protect the child. But actually, a lot of these problems are much more endemic and long-standing and enduring. So a single agency on its own cannot resolve these problems. What, what we have to do is find mechanisms of agencies genuinely connecting together around the needs of these children and these families in particular. Parental drug and alcohol abuse is a social policy issue, and it's a health issue. There's no question about it. Domestic violence has all sorts of housing, poverty, policing, health implications in terms of its management and its control. So simply parking this problem at the door of child protection and social workers will not solve the problem. It will provide a quick fix uh, to dealing with the immediate problem but not resolve the problem in any substantial way. So our work is largely focused on the risk and incidents. Actually, what causes that is patterns of functioning and impacts upon children. And many things underpinning that are, of course, structural issues around needs. So the focus of professionals is often at the top end of the risk. You talk to families, and their primary interest is how do we resolve some of these, these needs. In New Zealand, about one in four children, if you look at the academic est estimates, live in poverty. 2,700, 270,000 children live in poverty and obviously those factors have a significant impact on the quality of parenting, housing, employment, people, people's relationships and their ability to cope um, as parents. Taranaki, um, famous mountain there on the west coast, Tainui. So what else do we know about New Zealand? Well, 52% of children in care and protection systems are Māori, indigenous people, indigenous people of the land, um, and about half of the children in care are Māori. Interestingly, only 7% of Pacific children are in care and protection system, which absolutely replicates their demography in the country. So Māori represents about 15% of the total population in New Zealand. If you look at the projections, that's likely to rise to about 25% of the population by 2025. So Māori will become a quarter of the population by 2025. But overrepresented in any of the negative indicators you may seek to look at. 
Pacifica children are 7% of the population and 7% of the care and protection response system and care. Interesting difference, interesting difference. Of course, the, one of the key things is Pacifica families came in, deliberately moved into New Zealand for economic and social uh, reasons, very well organised around churches and local communities, and there are stronger support networks sometimes for Pacifica families than there are for Māori families. Māori were smashed up by the Europeans in the 1800s, and those communities, particularly urban Māori communities, are quite broken, quite broken up. Um, we have around 3,800 children with caregivers, and 60% of those are with the child's family whānau. So the WH is an F sound in Māori whānau, um, and increasingly numbers of children are moving to more permanent arrangements with family uh, and wider family networks. We have 700 frontline uh, social workers for the whole country and caseloads look high. And one of the things we're doing currently is a workload review. So I'm interested over the next three days if anyone's doing work around workload review, the work they're coming in, how we're managing caseloads, how you manage your workflow, I'd love to talk to you because we're doing that work also doing a in detailed study for the government and really interested to find out what you're learning and compare it with what we are, we're learning too. That's the Pahutakawa tree in Mahia Beach and my family there underneath the tree. Blossoms in uh, around uh, Christmas time and the blossom goes quite quickly actually. So one of the key thrusts of our work is um, uh, in partnership with Molly and we want to talk about how we're working in that space at the moment. So what we're working on is constructing an indigenous and bicultural principle practice framework, and we're doing that through consultations with frontline indigenous staff, traveling around the country, talking to social workers who are working in the space, um, understanding the types of practices indigenous practitioners are, use, are using to work almost under the radar of the organization to make a difference in terms of engagement with family whānau and different ways of working around children. So that process involves a number of uh, Ropu Iio Huis, where we are meeting with groups of practitioners around the country in Marae and talking with them about their best practice methodologies and how we build that uh, into our core uh, structures and systems. One of the challenges uh, in New Zealand is you have a number of iwi around the country and while there is a common core about the way they want to work around children and families, there's also some local differences as well. So how do you develop a way of practicing that holds out some national standards, expectations about what families can expect, children can expect, um, and then also accommodate local uh, uh, differences. Doing that through strategic partnerships with iwi, and building uh, new approaches to co-constructing practice and research around the work that we do with them. In particular, the strategic partnerships with IWI mean that they talk to us about the key things they'd like to see change inside practice, inside services, and we talk with them about how we can meet that, uh, that key uh, challenge. Um, the co-construction of research at a local level involves them leading the research practices with us. So action-based research is learning from indigenous practices and feeding that back into how we can improve our practice nationally. We're working with five key iwi at the moment, and the reason these five were picked was um, that they represent 90% of children in care. So from these five iwi, 90% of Māori children are in care. So we started conversations with them, Napui, Ngāti Pro, Tūhoi, uh, Waikato Tainui, and uh, Natahu. And what I find really interesting about that set of relationships is that um, assumptions we have as practitioners and organizations are profoundly challenged by how they see the way we should deliver services and practice. And one of the things that's been most striking in the relationships is giving them information. So one of the things that we don't have is information about patterns and trends around the country, and they're really struck by it. It seems to me that one of the great successes of social work today has been around information and education, giving people information to make choices about what they need to do and how they do it. And the stuff we've been talking about this morning about... Um, uh, uh, brain development, brain chemistry and how we're parenting is now starting to get into the dialogue and understanding of people around the world and affecting the way we think about it. i never forget sitting uh, as a social worker sitting in the front room of a, a grandma who was, who was sitting there with her daughter um, and uh, her grandchild and all three generations have been sexually abused. 
Um, and I was working with the youngest girl. She was eight years old. And the grandma was saying to me, you know, since people have started to talk about sexual abuse, it's just made everything easier. It's just made everything easier in terms of managing the problems and the needs of uh, my granddaughter and my daughter. And um, just that bringing people information, opening up a dialogue, making a huge difference. For us, giving Iwi the stat is making a huge difference in terms of what they want to do and how they're setting their priorities. Yep. I'm, I'm, I beg your pardon. So uh, inside of um, New Zealand culture and Māori culture, there are three key dimensions in relation to rela uh, key relationships as whānau. So whānau is a family, uh, and that's defined in the broadest sense, so it's an extended family. So the smallest unit of family in, in Māoridom is uh, extended family, grandparents, uncles, aunties, that's whānau, that's the first group. The second group is hapu, which is the clans or sub-tribes, so all the whānau that that whānau is connected to in their rohu, in their locality. And then iwi, the iwi is the tribe. Iwi is the tribe. Under the Treaty of Waitangi, um, the government is required to work in partnership with iwi um, as the indigenous people of the land, as tangata whenua, uh, uh, the indigenous people of the land. We have to work in ways that reflect a partnership with them, that re reflect their aspirations, their hopes and dreams. So iwi is a tribe. We all have our own tribes in a way. I mean, the, you know, we... Uh, when I was in the UK, we heard about uh, family group conferences and, and the first response from um, people in, in, in and around London was, well, that's okay for Māori, but it's not relevant to us. And then when you talk to people, well, can we tell me who's in your family network or tell me who uh, you're connected to, and suddenly people start to produce a long list of relationships and connections that they have. And you'd be surprised, if you do the exercise yourself, you'd be surprised how large that group is. So... Um, in Māoridom, the importance of family and connections and relationships is really important. It seems to me that one of the key challenges facing state child protection agencies today is how do you bring uh, together that sort of informal family network around the child together with the formal uh, network of state agencies and organisations to, to work together? How do you manage the borderline between the government and the family? And that's a key question. Uh, that's constantly on the mind of uh, practitioners in New Zealand, not least because of the Treaty of Waitangi, but also because the indigenous people of the land are demanding a new way of working uh, uh, alongside them. So family group conferences are a way of doing that, of bringing families together, communities together, and they do so uh, under a legal framework. That's uh, Nalahoe in the Tongariro National Park. So what are we doing? Well, the first thing we're doing is we're co-facilitating FGC. So typically in the past, family group conferences were organized by state agents. Now what's happening is iwi are leading the facilitation of these conferences, making the connections and relationships work around the child with our support, walking alongside us in a co-facilitated process. Uh, we're, we're creating coordinator posts outside the government organization, in NGOs and in communities, and growing capacity uh, inside of Iwi. Whakapapa search is the genealogy of a child, all the connections and relationships a child has, and Iwi are leading that. So when you talk to a social worker and you say, how much family does this child have? They'll give you a small, relatively small list of family. You talk to the Iwi and they will give you a very large list of connections and relationships the child has. Quite different perspective, quite a different perspective. In fact, there was an interesting study done by, just to illustrate the cultural uh, transference of this, the, there was an interesting study done by Peter Marsh at Sheffield University up in the north of England where I used to work, and he was looking at children leaving care. And he asked the social workers working with children leaving care, how many key relationships does this child have? And the average for the child, the average was three key relationships, three. Then they asked the child, the, same, the, the children, the same question. And the average number of key relationships the child identified was 19. So you see the difference from a government agency perspective to a child perspective about where are those key relationships because there's only so much access we will get to uh, in terms of understanding the, the, the depth and the breadth of those relationships. Increasing the use of whānau hui. So whānau hui is essentially a family meeting, bringing family together in the wider sense to discuss problems and hear about problems and make decisions about potential solutions. And redesigning our practice alongside the different tribes, the different iwi, 
to re re represent the tikanga, the traditions and culture of that particular iwi. Learning from indigenous practices and co-constructing evaluation. So here's the key challenge. How do we get a professional system, which tends to be structured, rules-based, formal, rational, to interact with a family system, which tends to be more dynamic, understandings-based, informal, and relational? How do we do that? It seems to me that given the complexity of the needs around children, that no one single agency can resolve the problem, certainly not child protection agencies. We can only do a piece around that. How do we bring a range of government agencies and NGOs and community groups to work together with a range of family and community networks around children? Family group conferences, whānau a hui, are real ways in which we can bring together that formal and informal network to collaborate together. And the challenge for us is to do that work in a way that's flexible and adaptable to the needs of the community. That is a challenge. When you're doing conferences or meetings on the sort of industrial levels that people are doing them on, you know, 8,000, 10,000 conferences annually, how do you work in ways that do reflect the culture and values and traditions of those um, communities? So what are some of the new developments with family group conferences? Well, the first is strong multi-agency work. So we're seeing very clearly that schools, health, uh, housing, mental health services in particular, and adult services are key players in terms of getting better outcomes for children and young people. Benchmarking our best coordinators, so looking at their micro skills and their practice and benchmarking that to make sure that we're looking at the best possible practice methods, new standards and training and support you're seeing. And then we're going to increase the number of family group conferences happening in New Zealand. So we're finding this an effective way of working with children and young people. Uh, particularly good in getting early resolutions with families and, where possible, keeping children within their wider family networks. And the, the work is being studied by Canterbury University, looking at uh, longer-term outcomes for children and young people in that process. This is Karis. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, children now. Um, one of our key aspirations is to strengthen the profile and the voice uh, of children and ensure that they have a, uh, an even stronger say in what happens. And that seems uh, uh, absolutely the right thing to do. This would be a better world for children if parents had to eat spinach, said Groucho Marx. I rather like that, rather like that quote. I remember um, uh, one of the challenges our kids gave us, that whole thing about communicating with children. You know when you think you're communicating with kids? You think you've got the message, or they think you understand what they're saying, you don't. So Rihanna, when she was little, had this little um, pet gorilla. She loved this gorilla, man. She loved it. It was a big furry thing, very round, with very long arms, big eyes. And she used to carry it around everywhere with her. She just adored it. Anyway, one morning she was lying, because our kids used to, in the morning when they were little, our kids used to get in the bed with us and we'd have like a little tea party in the bed, have tea and biscuits every morning, and the kids would be in the bed. And you know those moments where kids get really up close to your face when they're little? So Nikki was lying on the pillow like this, and, and Rihanna had her face up really close to her, and she was just talking to her in the morning. She was stroking her face like this, and she was saying, Oh, mummy, you are so lovely. Nikki thought, well, this is nice. Yeah. Oh, mummy, she said, you are so beautiful. So this is a nice way to start the morning. Yeah. Oh, mummy, you are so hairy. <laughs> just like a gorilla. Um, of course, that was a huge compliment from her perspective, um, but Nikki didn't see it, see it quite the same way. Um, but it's funny, isn't it, how kids communicate things and they think they're communicating one thing and we're interpreting or hearing something completely, um, completely different. So one of the challenges we have uh, in our work, I think, is how do we express or understand better um, outcomes from a child's perspective? What would children say about the outcomes they want from family group conferences, whānau hui, child protection social workers, all this intervention we do in their lives? What would they say about it? And would they describe outcomes or results different to the way we as agencies describe them? So what do we talk about? We talk about safety and stability and permanence, don't we? We talk about those sorts of ideas. Children, what would they speak about? They'd speak about being loved, having fun being with family, friends, you know. But they, how do you measure those things? How do you account for and measure those things and, and in a way that's easy to explain to the public, to ministers, to other agencies? Hard to do. 
So we need some new ways of articulating this and capturing this. So here's my first go at this. So here's Rihanna in a coffee shop in North Yorkshire before we came over here. And she's having a favourite thing in the world, which is hot chocolate. Well, she loves hot chocolate, right? So that's her favourite thing. So imagine that as the intervention. And then here's the outcome. <laughs> okay, so it's really obvious, isn't it? You can see it's really obvious. But how do you capture that stuff? How do we re report on that stuff, capture it and explain it to people in a way that we are accountable as public servants working in that space? So it seems to me there are a number of key challenges in relation to enhancing the position of children and young people in our work. Um, how do we define outcomes that reflects more strongly what children want? Challenge ourselves. Do adults know what is best for children? Particularly when, or perhaps especially when, we won't be the consumer of whatever decision is made. It seems to me children face a kind of double jeopardy when they work with statutory social workers. First, they have to hope that they can explain to social workers what's really happening for them, what they want to happen, and hope that they will be understood. And secondly, they know they're communicating that to a very powerful individual who's in a position to make life-changing decisions about them. And what the research is starting to indicate is children are um, trying to guess the right answers to the questions of social workers so they can affect the outcome, rather than genuinely being at the centre of decision-making and influencing the way things go. And it seems to me exactly the same thing applies to families. If families feel marginalised, or children feel marginalised in a decision-making approach affecting them, a lack of commitment to the plans of professionals is almost inevitable. But this can easily be misinterpreted or misunderstood as a lack of commitment to children. What then develops is a cycle of mistrust and misunderstanding where both sides of the relationship come to expect the worst of each other when we know effective professional relationships with family community are a really strong route to better outcomes for children and young people. How do we capture children's voices and their wishes and their feelings in a way that really reflects their aspirations so that we see children as citizens in their own right rather than objects of children? How do we reconceptualize our relationship with children so that we understand that children can genuinely have a say over what happens in their future rather than just our strong desire to protect them from further harm. It's a very complex and tricky balancing act. It seems to me that children should be understood as key participants in influencing their futures and shaping their futures uh, and outcomes. Okay, so well, there's Karis on the surfboard, my eldest. I've got to get a quick question for you, because I know you've been sitting and listening a lot, very patiently. We're moving towards coffee in about 20 minutes. Um, what I'd like to do with the person next to you, or anyone else in the room you'd like the look of, is, um, describe the best practice you've seen in enhancing children's participation in decision-making. And what is your most radical idea about that? Describe the best practice you've seen in enhancing children's participation in decision-making and what's the most radical idea you have about improving that. So have a chat with someone next to you just for a few minutes and then I'm just going to take your best ideas. Thank you. Okay. We're just going to take three ideas. We want to, I'm, the, the, we're just going to take three radical ideas. So the more radical, the better. Um, um, for those of you staying this evening, the most radical idea I will buy a, a beer or a glass of wine for. This is a sort of incentive. I know it's early on a Monday morning, but that's the best I can do at this moment in time. Um, so three radical ideas for enhancing children's participation. Yep. Hi, it's Sue Foley here from the Children's Hospital at Westmead and also the Children's Court Clinic in New South Wales. I use Liana Lowenstein's... Um, um, Butterflies, so two big butterflies, three little ones. I was seeing these kids who needed to be, who were asking for restoration. I used this for this child to actually tell me about the things that were worrying her the most. And then from that, the short version, um, was that she told me and then I had a session with her with her father who'd been stabbed by the mother and she'd never actually had a chance to talk to him or anyone about how she felt. So, so it was a therapeutic intervention that used a, a tool and that actually used kind of a family therapy kind of model um, 
to allow that communication to happen that was very deep, very powerful, very narrative and very, very um, uh, contributory of her views and what she thought and she felt safe enough because I had time to. Hi, uh, this is Rubina and uh, well I would say that if we make social and emotional learning mandatory in all schools for all children, um, then we are equipping them with the emotional literacy but when they grow up to be adults they actually have already practiced they are not hiding from their feelings so their children are not hiding from their feelings and we create a cycle in which probably not today but in hundred years time there is a society that understands feelings and is able to communicate at a better level than we today do that's a lovely idea. That's really prevention. Uh, sorry, it, it, just one more thing. <laughs> I mean, it is a lovely idea, but just to, just to make that in Singapore, the government has made social and emotional learning mandatory in all schools. And so there are countries that are recognizing that, but just not every country, I guess. I can kind of reflect on that because there's two things. Remember the conflicts in Northern Ireland we used to have in Britain, and a terrible conflict that used to go there at the time of the Troubles, and people would wouldn't even tell you where they were from because there's so much anxiety about the consequences of that. Uh, and actually, the government did two things in relation to that community to ease the conflict and ease the violence. The first was they invested in it to reduce poverty, because actually it was the poorest part of the UK. They invested in it to reduce poverty. And the second thing they did was they invested in schools. And they got Catholic and Protestant children educated together in the same school. And that made a huge difference. those children so <laughs> from back then um, another idea is we I'm from save the children but we have a child parliament in Bangladesh where children uh, participate in decision making at the highest level so they have their week where they bring back their issues and they've had laws enacted such as teachers can't physically punish them teachers cannot be on their mobile phones when they're teaching and their laws now so that's what happens when you ask kids <laughs> Very good. I'm going to buy a drink for all three of you because they're all such good ideas. So find me out in the bar tonight. Thank you for that. It seems to me interesting that if we, if we reduce the voting age in this country, in New Zealand and around the world, what would happen? What would happen to social policy? What would happen to child protection policy? How different would it look? Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if we would reduce the voting age? What's a reasonable age to reduce it to? Twelve? Five? Love it. Brilliant. I, I think we could, I think reduce it to 10, 12 would be a fascinating uh, d demonstration of seeing children as citizens in this community and changing the politics of the country would be absolutely brilliant, brilliant thing to do. Okay, I'm just going to go on and finish about, um, uh, oh, Hayden, um, Prof. Welsh Rugby supporter, the policy issues before we, we close. And um, I talked a lot about the engagement of family and Fano and doing work in a way that suits the culture and traditions of different iwi and community members. I want to talk a bit about what's happening in New Zealand now in terms of the Vulnerable Children's Bill, which is new legislation that's currently been read in the House and going through a select committee process. The first thing inside of that is um, the government is setting up a multi-agency governance and accountability for vulnerable children. So across government... Uh, and other organisations is going to be a shared accountability for outcomes for vulnerable children governed by a common outcomes framework. And this is simply because, I'm sure like here, what we're seeing is very uh, significant problems for children that are multifaceted, that simply no one agency on its own can resolve. Uh, if a child is in school, the chances of their placement breaking down are hugely reduced. The chances of them reoffending is reduced. If a child's out of school, the chances of their placement breaking down is increased. The chance of them reoffending is increased. Very, very strong connections. If parents are positive about school and education, the child will do better. If the teacher can engage with the child, it will make a difference in terms of outcomes. So the connections are very, very strong. Statistically, if a child does well in school, their future life chances are hugely enhanced. And a strong focus on vulnerable children is what we need to break some of the cycles we're seeing where children are going through care and just becoming the future parents of future clients of child protection agencies. 
Similarly, the health needs of children are profound who are caught in care and protection systems, absolutely profound. We have a gateway assessment system which assesses children who come into care, and we're seeing very complex needs of children coming to care, social psychological needs, behavioural needs, and physical needs. In the first 50 we audited, 10% had undiagnosed holes in the heart. So you start to see some very significant health issues and needs coming through when you start to have a more detailed look at the profile uh, of these children. No single agency can resolve it on their own. Common outcomes framework takes us to a place where we can work together around end results for children and a single national plan. That is to prioritise and coordinate services for the most vulnerable, strengthen information sharing, nothing new in that, and a, a, a knowledge hub that sits outside of government where different agencies will bring their data and information about the needs of children, and that will be uh, collated, analysed, producing knowledge about the types of needs that are out there in New Zealand, the types of needs that these children and young people um, face. In addition to that, we're developing local children's teams, uh, which is an intensive family support. Their members are iwi, community, and other agencies working together below the threshold of child, youth and family, but providing an early, coordinated and an integrated response to more complex, multifaceted needs. So getting in early alongside EWE, alongside NGOs and other agencies, but in a much more coordinated and structured way uh, around the needs of children. There's some provisions in the legislation around checking serious offenders, so people with convictions uh, will have, or, or serious um, uh, allegations proven in civil court, so it's a different threshold and quite controversial uh, in the country, tracking adults who move between families and across communities, uh, and screening and vetting of the workforce. And a key piece of this interagency work, of course, is workforce development and people's thinking and attitude and how we collaborate. Peter, Col uh, Peter, Peter, Culture. Peter Drucker, a famous uh, uh, political commentator, one said, Organization, organizational culture eats policy for breakfast, which I thought was a really good uh, quote and says a lot, doesn't it? You know that organizational culture you've got to try and navigate all the time and how do you set the right organizational culture so people can, can genuinely work together around the needs of children. It's a quick diagram of the system. So the children's teams operate in this space here below the SIF threshold, cross-agency teams uh, working together around more complex uh, and high needs. It's Narahui. And finally, some of the practice highlights. So we have an assessment model now, uh, which was developed in consultation with Māori. It's called Tui Tuya. And Tui Tuya is a term which means weaving together the core aspects of a child's life, weaving together the core aspects of a child's life. Um, and it involves contributions from schools, health, adult mental health, adult corrections, social workers, bringing all that knowledge together alongside the knowledge and the resources within the iwi, the whānau and the community, how you meld those two together. And we're using uh, uh, Tuituia alongside FGCs to bring that formal and informal network together. Um, getting a assessment contributions from a range of agencies and, of course, children's voices and participation. What we're working towards, we're not there yet, and I know jurisdictions all around the world have struggled. This is just having one plan for a child, not multiple assessments and multiple plans, but coalescing family and community and agencies around a single plan for a child. We actually, in legislation, already have a very good mechanism to do that, which is the family group conference, bringing together the formal and informal networks around children to create a single plan. And strengthening the reviewing of our care plans, because we're seeing that it's a key area for children in care. We're seeing the multi-agency, multifaceted needs of children in care as very significant. I'm not going to ask you that question, but I'm sure it's one that haunts you every day. Uh, you can just think about that one and talk to your colleagues about that. We don't have time for that today, but what are the best ideas around improving interagency work? This has to be the direction of travel, given the nature and the needs of the children we're working with. So I just want you to dwell on that, but not try to answer that this morning. And any brilliant ideas, I would love to hear. Two beers and two glasses of wine for that, because we're <laughs> three beers, actually. A really, really tricky area. And, of course, this. You know, we talk about involvement, participation, we're working together, and then we fail through the basics around that. You know, having a meeting, we don't invite the school. 
we fail to call people back. Doing that as part of our core day-to-day -day business seems incredibly important. And then just serve some final thoughts about change, really. Um, he that complies against his will evolves the same opinion still. So winning hearts and minds in this journey is a key step we're on now in terms of the work in New Zealand. That's a picture I took in Kai Kaikoura from a boat looking back towards the land. It's a whale. Change is disturbing when it is done to us, but exhilarating when it is done by us, so keeping people part of that process. Kids in Rarotonga and running on the beach. So I want to just finish um, with a, a, a quote from Titai Tokoro in the North Island, top of the North Island, Māori, um, a Māori proverb. And then I'm going to sing a little song because it's traditional to sing a waiata, so I'll sing a little Welsh song to finish. Um, you have to put your fingers in your ears at that moment. <laughs> Here's the problem. Stand at the stern of the waka, the canoe. Stand at the stern of the waka and feel the bite of the future on your face. I rather like that.